Good morning, Walden Church. Today, I have a question for you. Have you ever fallen asleep in class? Have you ever fallen asleep in class? Maybe it was a college lecture, a darkened room, or worse, have you ever fallen asleep at church? Today is Palm Sunday, and it is the day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it's the beginning of Holy Week. But amidst all the excitement and the tension, we have this story where the disciples tucker out and fall asleep when Jesus perhaps needed them the most. Matthew 21 says, Now they were drawing near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage, the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus and the disciples draw near to Jerusalem. And the Bible says this because they were away. And despite what we might think in our heads, Jesus didn't spend a lot of time in the city of Jerusalem. He, he went for major holidays, he goes for festivals, but he spent an equal amount of time walking and visiting the surrounding cities, which might sound odd. I mean, given that Jesus only had a three-year ministry and you'd think if you want to make your largest impact, you'd go to the biggest city, you'd go where there is the most activity, the most people, and that would probably be true. But with that also puts you around the majority of your enemies. Rome has a big presence in Jerusalem. The Jewish council has a big presence in Jerusalem. And the real reason that Jesus is away from there is because there are always people trying to kill him. So knowing that, maybe now that he's going to Jerusalem, maybe we find a back door in, right? Maybe we lay low for a little while. Maybe we come at night. Nope, not Jesus. Jesus parades into town knowing, fully knowing the future that lies ahead of him. This Palm Sunday, I want to talk about the future. I want to talk about Jesus' future, yes, but ours too. I mean, what would you do if you knew the future wasn't good? If you knew there was something coming that you might be afraid of, maybe there's a talk coming up or a confrontation that you're not looking forward to having, what did Jesus do? Well, he rode into town on the back of a donkey while people waved palm branches. Matthew 21 verse 6 says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. As Passion Week begins, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, and he looks like a king. But he does not come as a conquering king who is trying to overthrow. Instead, he comes as this humble savior who is trying to set people free. He does not come riding into town on a white stallion with a shining sword like the soldiers of Rome. Instead, he comes on a young donkey. Nor does he come with a massive army. Instead, he comes with followers and disciples, fishermen and women who sing and praise God for all that they have seen this man do in their lives. Okay, but after he arrives, then Jesus and the disciples, they lay low for a little while, right? I mean, they get a small hotel room and they sit around and they watch TV until the heat blows away. No, no, he doesn't lay low. Jesus goes straight to the temple and he throws the tables around. He drives out the sacrificial animals. He scatters their coins. Then does he lay low? 
I mean, for a guy who wanted to uh, kind of hide away from the law, for a guy who has his own fair share of enemies, he sure is causing a scene. Uh, Jesus, yeah, he doesn't do it any other way. First thing he does, he goes off and kills a fig tree. <laughs> he then tells a parable about two sons, and he tells the parable of the tenants. He tells the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. Then he tells the parable of the wedding feast, and he teaches about whether we should pay our taxes. He teaches about end times a lot, and he openly speaks against the scribes and the Pharisees. And after all of that, surprise, surprise, Matthew 26 verse 1 says, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, let there be an uproar among the people. So the wheels are in motion. This is it. Jesus isn't laying low, and neither are his enemies. Jesus is pushing all of their buttons and they are not going to put up with it anymore. In the next couple days, Jesus takes his disciples into an upper room. He shares the Passover meal with them. And during that meal, he says, hey guys, let's go for a walk. Matthew 26 verse 36 says, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter, and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus had finished his Passover meal with his disciples, and now he's preparing himself for what comes next, the cross. And this garden prayer, this garden moment, is where we see Jesus at his most vulnerable and he almost seems most human, perhaps most like us. You know, sometimes you look at Jesus and you read a Jesus story and you think, wow, he is so much more than me, so much more loving than me, so much more forgiving than me, so much more powerful than me. And here in this story, what do we see him do? Verse 39 says, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Wow. I mean, we have all been there at some time or another, seeking the direction that we should go, asking God which path we should take. You look down the path and you see that there's something coming that's way too stressful, way too painful, way too large, way too scary. And just thinking, I, I can't complete this. I can't do this. We've prayed the same prayer. We look for a way out. We look for escape. Which is weird because this is the Messiah and we picture Jesus. He is the one who saves. He is the rescuer. And here Jesus is asking to be rescued. But not only that, before this, he he asks for our company, right? I mean, when I think about a scary future or maybe a task that I'm not prepared for, I'll pray that Jesus goes with me. But Jesus, in this story, he asks his friends to go with him. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Friends help carry you. And not just physically, they, emotionally. They, they carry you through those moments in life. And we are all given this biblical responsibility that when hard times come, we support one another. We carry one another's burdens just as Galatians asks. And as much as we need to be available for our brothers and sisters, we also need to have the courage that it, when it's our turn, then we are vulnerable enough to ask for their help, that we would ask for their support, that we would tell them, I need your shoulder to cry on. It's important. 
it is important because that's what community is all about. And then Jesus prays. He says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What was this cup? Well, it was his burden. It was his responsibility. It was the future that was lying ahead of him. The cup that he says, remove this. This is the the sin of the world. It was the sin of everyone since the beginning of time, going forward all the way into the future until he returns as king. And here we see Jesus pray for himself. And he prays a prayer that we would pray, a prayer of desperation, a prayer of intensity, but at the same time, not a prayer like I typically pray. Because while Jesus does ask for a way out, he also prays for God's sovereignty. The word sovereign means that God is in complete control of everything. God is sovereign, which means he is in control of all things at all times. And Jesus is okay with that. He says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's suffering. He's facing a future that he'd rather not, but he doesn't doubt God's power and he doesn't doubt God's will. It was a prayer. It was a struggle between father and son that results in Jesus submitting to the will of his father. And we will pray this prayer again, won't we? Maybe it'll be a job promotion or a move. It might be the choice of a spouse or the choice of a career or the choice of a lifetime. But in any case, we will come to the same garden prayer and we will plead for our future. We will beg for the choice to be made, hopefully, and hopefully we will also pray for God's sovereignty. But while Jesus is praying, and he's out there with his friends, his friends who should have his back. This also happens in verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch me this one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, while Jesus is in his most desperate hour and he's face down in prayer, his disciples are face down in prayer sleep. (laughs) Jesus is praying, Father, I know you have my back. And while he's praying this, while he's saying this, he's also kind of looking around and noticing that the disciples don't have his. Has that ever happened to you? Has that ever been your story? That in the middle of your suffering and your pain, your friends that you thought were going to be there weren't. This is why he wanted them there to pray with him for his sorrow to be theirs, for them to care about the things that he cares about. And so he says, wake up. Did they wake up? Matthew 26, verse 42 says, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. They didn't wake up. Jesus is burdened in this moment to pray, and they are burdened only to sleep. Jesus' first impulse is to pray for his future, pray for his death, but the disciples selfishly are only concerned with their own need. And I mean, I get it, right? Why why even pray? Why bother? God is just going to do what he always does. I mean, he's going to do what he wants. My prayer isn't really going to change anything. Is that true? I mean, last week we read Jesus say that if you pray, you can even cast out demons. In fact, he said prayer is sometimes the only thing that works. Jesus asks his friends to come along with him and pray. Ephesians 6 says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, pray without ceasing. The Bible never says 
don't bother praying because God is just going to do what he always does. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. Jesus says in Matthew 21, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Faith in what? Faith in prayer, right? If you're going to pray, you got to believe that prayer works. Faith in what? Faith in God. Jesus knows prayer works. He doesn't doubt his Father's power. Jesus prays. The writer of Hebrews 11 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The Bible never says, don't bother praying because God is just going to do what he always does. In fact, prayer is rewarded. The Bible says faith is rewarded. We pray and we have faith and we trust that God always responds. The story continues. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus prays a third time. He doesn't quit. He he doesn't think it's futile. He doesn't think it's one and done. He, He returns to his disciples a third time and finds them still asleep. And he says, take your sleep later on. Rest later. There is still work to do. The story says, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, And with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, we know from other passages that this is Peter with his sword. Peter who is swift to take action. Peter who draws his sword and fights. Peter cuts a man's ear off. What? What is going on? Well, Peter and the other disciples were asleep. They didn't understand. They didn't listen to Jesus' prayer. So they weren't on the same page. After all, Jesus just rode into town on a donkey as king. They were all still high on Palm Sunday and all the bold and brash things Jesus did when he arrived. He called out the officials. He flipped tables in the synagogues. The excitement was mounting. The tension was building. The disciples and all those traveling with Jesus into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday celebrated and they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That cry, Hosanna, it's the cry, oh, save. The people were crying out for deliverance because a king was coming and the people shouted, save us. But everyone in this scene, including his own disciples, didn't fully understand who he was. Who is Jesus? Who is this man riding into town on a donkey? Who is this prophet flipping tables and speaking out against the Jewish leaders? Who is this teacher who speaks in parables? If I took you by the hand and I said, come and see Jesus, who would I be taking you to see? That question is so important. And that's why we've been talking about it for 10 weeks. Jesus said who he was. And he even told Peter very plainly, Earlier in Matthew 16, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus told Peter who the Messiah was, and Peter didn't believe it. In fact, Peter denies the future that's coming. And he decides to 
make his own future. Peter is quick to pick up a sword. He's quick to fight. He says, with a sword in my hand, watch what I can do. And yet, Jesus, ever their teacher, had brought them out to the garden not to fight, but to pray. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Peter was not willing to accept the future that lay ahead. He wasn't ready to understand who Jesus was or what Jesus came to do. So Peter doesn't pray. He doesn't pray for God's will or he doesn't allow God's will. He takes action. He takes his own action. Isn't that how we were raised? Actions speak louder than words, right? Why are we all talking? Let's fight. Let's do something. Praying doesn't help. Look at the two examples we have in this story. Jesus submits to his Father's will. Peter doesn't submit. He takes charge. He tries to control the situation. And Jesus says, Peter, put your sword away. I didn't come to fight. I came to die. Maybe, you know, maybe we don't pray because we don't want to hear what God is saying. We don't want to see what God is doing. Or, like Peter, we don't agree with God's future. Is God only good when we agree with him? Does God only bless us when we get what we want? Jesus didn't get what he wanted. He asked to be spared that future. He wanted to be delivered. But he never accused the character of God. And he never doubted. And he didn't say, well, God is going to do what he's going to do, so why bother praying? No, He prayed to be delivered, even though he knew that he wouldn't be. Philippians 2.8 says, In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus obeyed the will of God, even when that will was his death. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into town, not towards victory, but death. How many of us would do that? How many of us, when we know that the future is not good, when there's something coming that we're afraid of, maybe it's a talk or it's a confrontation, it's some sort of experience that we're not ready to have, how many of us pray against it, ask God to remove it, And we'll even draw our swords ready to charge against that future and change it any way we can. We've all been there. We've all had that night in the garden, fighting against sleep, praying over and over, begging God to be delivered. And if I took you by the hand and I said, come and see Jesus, I would take you to a king who is willing to lay his own crown on the ground, knowing that God was sovereign. And this, this may be the hardest lesson to learn this Easter season. It's probably the hardest lesson to learn ever. If I lose something or I misplace something in my house, I'll tear my house apart until I find it again. And that's my need to be in control of my possessions. If something breaks, I'm restless until it's fixed or replaced. That's my need to control things that work. If we're all watching TV together as a family, I have to be in control of the remote. If I'm going on a long trip, I have to be in control of driving. The world we live in tells us on TV, the news, the media, the internet, the government, everything is out of control, right? 
That's what's on TV. That's the news. Everything is out of control. So that creates a strong desire in me to take control of whatever I can. Listen to me very carefully. The things that you worry about are areas where you believe that the world around you, your health, your home life, your job, the government, are areas that you believe are out of control. And when you watch the news, what do you see? A world out of control. They show you the bad news on purpose. They want you to be on edge. Humans have this need to control what is happening in the world. And we worry and we stress and we stay awake at night and we'll draw our swords ready to fight when we feel like our future is out of control. And we do this to create a positive outcome in the world around us. But ultimately, it causes us to live in fear. If you don't believe me, when the White House is red, blue lives in fear. When the White House is blue, red lives in fear. COVID is coming to an end, so obviously mass shootings have to come back. Racism is fear. War is fear. Hate is fear. Perhaps the fear of what might happen or the fear of what is happening already in the world around us or the fear of what others might say or others might do. And our fears govern our decisions and the way we run our lives and the way we run the world. So what can we learn from Palm Sunday? That perhaps it's time to lay down our swords, just like Jesus tells us to, and to put aside our fear and our need to control. And we simply allow God's love to do what it does best. 1 John 4, 8 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. God's perfect love casts out all fear because it was expressed by our Lord Jesus Christ when he laid down his life for us. Yes, he prayed the prayer that we all pray. Take this pain away. But he also lived our life and he died our death and he rose again so that we could participate in a perfect relationship with our Heavenly Father and in a loving relationship with each other. Jesus did three things during his time here on earth. He preached, he taught, he healed. How sad, how utterly sad that in his last lesson to his 12 disciples, they slept through it. They were asleep in class. They were asleep in church. Jesus knew the path before him was difficult. He knew it was a future that was out of his control. So his last lesson on earth, he modeled for us all a prayer that admitted our fears, admitted our human need to be saved, while at the same time, it completely removed our need to be in control of the outcome. Last week I asked, when was the last time you prayed? And today I'm asking, when was the last time you prayed, your will be done, and meant it? We turn to God in prayer. And it means we come and we bring him our fears, we bring him our requests, but it also means that we turn our trust away from everything else and we only direct it towards him. Stop turning on the news. Stop reading social media and looking for solutions. And most importantly, stop trying to be in control. God is in control. God is the only solution to your problems. You don't control your kids' lives. You don't control your grandkids' lives. You don't even control your own life. Stop spying on your neighbors. You don't control their lives. Stop trying to be in control. Psalm 115 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Job lost everything, remember? Job lost everything in his life and he prayed, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Daniel 4, all the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Psalm 135 says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and at all deeps. What is prayer? Jesus prays and he models prayer. Prayer is the complete surrender and admission that God alone is in control. God is in charge and he is responsible for all of my difficulties and he'll be responsible for all the outcomes. An honest and vulnerable prayer says, Lord, I don't have all the answers, but I trust that you will reveal them to me in your perfect time. And God's answer may not be the experience or the resolution that we want. And like Peter, the future or or the answer may make us uneasy, but we need to learn to rest in God's sovereignty because Jesus did. After all, let's face it, God has already answered all of our prayers, hasn't he? If you've ever prayed to be spared or rescued or saved, he already did that. A hundred times over, more than we could ever want or ask. You might be walking a difficult road right now. Or a difficult road may be coming up. And during this time of trial, while there's hard decisions to be made, while sacrifices are asked of us, perhaps relationships are held off at a distance, the lesson of the garden says, God is in control. He alone is sovereign. And we can trust our future with him. May you surrender your own efforts to be your own savior. And rather, may you be humble and allow Jesus to be who he is, your savior, your Lord. He is the one who mounts the steed and marches straight towards his own destruction for you. He is the one who bears your burden, even when you didn't deserve it. Come and see the Messiah King who modeled a life of surrender and love and who taught us to place our faith in our sovereign Father. Come and see the King of Kings. Come and see the Lord of Lords. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Palm Sunday and for this Passion Week. May each day be a remembrance of the things that Jesus did and lived and taught. And as we near the cross and as we near the tomb, prepare our hearts and our minds for what lies ahead. Something, yes, the disciples feared. And yes, Jesus even asked to be removed. But ultimately, the cross and the empty tomb are my salvation. And they are beautiful because my Savior is beautiful. And I can trust you, my God, because you are sovereign. Watch over my life. Protect us and keep us safe. Draw us near. Watch over those who are not with us today. Continue to heal and make your presence known in their lives. And may we go from this place shouting your praise, waving our palm branches, and saying, Hosanna. Here comes the King of Kings. Amen. I hope you have had a great Palm Sunday experience, and I hope that you are uh, feeling good, enjoying this day, uh, getting ready for Easter and Good Friday. We've got those services coming up as well. Good Friday will be this Friday at 6.30 here in the chapel. Uh, We don't have childcare or anything like that. It's usually more of a a somber service, but we really strongly urge you to attend. Uh, We'll also be having our communion time during that service, and we'll be 
uh, really focusing on the cross and what the cross has done for us. And then Easter morning, we have two services. We have 7 a.m. at the Yacht Club flagpole. We'll have seating for 200, but if you would like to bring your own chair and socially distant, you are more than welcome to do that. We'll have an Easter egg hunt for the kids following that morning service. And then we'll have one service back here at the church at 9.30, and we'll have an Easter egg hunt for the kids following that. And of course, we'll have a children's program during that 9.30 service as well. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.